I'm your host, Brian Watkins, and welcome to another edition of the Brian Watkins channel. My subject today is about what I miss most about Marvin Gaye. The reason why I'm making this video, for those of you who feel the same way, let's get started. Shout out to all of my viewers. Whether you've been with me from the beginning, just saw one of my videos for the first time and you decided to subscribe, and those of you that have been donating to my channel, I appreciate the support because without you, I am nothing. Let's get started. Viewers, ladies and gentlemen, Marvin Gaye. Before I get started, I just finished reading an autobiography written by his second wife, Janice Gay. Get the book. Interesting, but quite tragic. Now, I remember coming into a knowledge of Marvin Gaye in 1976. He had just came out with uh, his hit song, I Want You. My late stepfather, may he rest in peace, he had purchased the album and brought it over to a home we were living in on Tarman in Detroit, Michigan, on the west side. I remember it clear as day in the summer of 1976. I automatically liked what I heard. In fact, <laughs> I thought it was my stepfather saying that he played Marvin Gaye's music so much and I never got tired of hearing it. And uh, I saw the album cover and um, he had had a blue convertible LTD. It was blue and uh, rag top black. And he would always play that song, I Want You. And um, because of the album cover for that particular musical composition, Marvin Gaye's face wasn't on it, so I had never thought who Marvin Gaye was because, mind you, the lights and gas was turned off quite a bit before my mother met my stepfather. So you don't get to, you know, hear things that you might take for granted, like the radio or the television. So I, I didn't know how he looked, never heard his music. That was my first time hearing it. And I liked what I heard. So when we ended up moving off Tarman and moving on Mound Road in Nevada, in Detroit, Michigan, okay, by this time he had dropped. Got to give it up. And um, I was in the second grade. And my late stepfather bought me a fully loaded bike for having a good report card. And it was the summer of 1977, if I'm not mistaken. Gots to Give It Up was a big hit because it was the disco era, which I didn't know what that meant at that time. All I know was I liked Marvin Gaye's music. So by this time, I got a chance to see him on the cover of Gots to Give It Up because uh, he was on the cover, so I saw him for the first time. So, we end up moving off Mound and moving on to a street called Cardone in Detroit, Michigan, off Seven Mile, not too far from I-75. Um, at that time, I really didn't recall hearing anything from him because uh, I ended up learning by reading the autobiography that his second wife had wrote. He had got a divorce from his first wife, Anna, and he was uh, ordered to pay alimony and child support. So that album here, my dear, was that particular time. So I hadn't heard nothing from him. But by this time, here and there, I'm hearing like older music material that he had made, you know, still with Motown, like uh, Heard It Through the Grapevine, um, My Mistake, um, It Takes Two, 
you know, and I'm like, I, I, oh, stubborn kind of fella, uh, pride and joy. So by this time, I'm already a uh, Marvin Gaye fan, and I'm only like, I'm not even nine years old. So by this time, uh, we end up moving on Coventry, still in Detroit, Michigan, off Seven Mile and John R. Road. And he came out with Sexual Healing, uh, 1983. Huge, huge hit. Put him back on the map. So um, by this time, you know, I'm still hearing like all different types of his music. Uh, Trouble Man, What's Going On. Uh, well, you know, he came out with a lot of stuff. So I'm like, okay, this sounds really cool. I'm digging him. My, my late stepfather turned me on, you know, to his music and whatnot. And um, what else? Oh, never forget, though. All right, so when he come out with Sexual Healing, blew up, right? My mother went to go see him in concert. So he gave a fantastic concert, right? And um, wow, April 1st. I think because April Fool, somebody said Marvin Gaye got shot and killed by his father. I'm like, that's a cruel April Fool joke. No, turned out to be real. Dead. I never heal from that. Never. Because Marvin Gaye's style of singing unique. I have never heard the I like the way he can harmonize with himself where you can you can feel it, you know, deep in your existence, right down to the bone. It really don't matter what kind of music he sings. You can just feel it. And you know it's him right away, you know. He had that signature sound. So by this time I'm like, okay, I've never heard any other artist that even reminds me of Marvin Gaye. Period. Bobby Brown mentioned him in Tenderoni. So let's hear some Marvin Gaye. Um, oh, but see, I'm purposely not trying to elaborate on the autobiography that his second wife wrote about him. All I can tell you all is to read it as soon as possible. You know, I didn't I didn't know that he had all those problems. I didn't. I really didn't know. All I know is I liked his music and I still like his music today. You know, especially because I'm a lot older. I can appreciate his music even more because we're living in a different time of music now. You know, it's more so digital music. Uh, some of it is okay. Some of it, you know, but again, we're just living in a different time of music. Whereas in those eras where Motown was, what, the 60s, uh, the 70s. So you really heard a full band or in-house musicians. Just like I didn't know that he had started out as a drummer at first. I had no idea. I just thought he automatically started as a singer. You know, I didn't know that he feared touring. I didn't know that he suffered from stage fright. Because when you listen to a Marvin Gaye's musical composition, do you hear any of that in his, his music? No, not at all. I was stunned that he suffered from stage fright and that he, you know, didn't like touring anything. It just, it blew me away. So all in all, what I miss most about uh, Marvin Gaye is not only the excellent voice and his style of singing, but he always had a message in the music or a story where when you listen to his music, you hear and see exactly what he's talking about in your mind, whether you agree with it or not, is irrelevant. But it's very clear that you know you're going to enjoy his music. And um, 
I wish I had got a chance to see him in concert, but at the time when he was at his peak, I was still a kid. So ladies and gentlemen, ah, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That's what I miss most about Myron Gang. Subscribe to my channel, you know, for the usual reasons. I make videos constantly and you can win cash. So hit that red button and don't you go anywhere.